God. By your hand, Father, by your mercy on us, Lord, you know our frame. You know my frame, that I am useless. I am dust, God, without your spirit. And yet you breathe in me new life, God. And I pray for a fresh filling this morning for myself. God, for this church, do all that you desire to do. God, we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, have a seat and turn over in your Bibles to the book of Acts. We are back in the book of Acts this morning, chapter 7 specifically, where we will take down a majority of this chapter, and what a great chapter it is. Man, I'm so excited. I'm excited about this, uh, this morning with you guys because it's not just about Acts chapter 7. Although Acts chapter 7 lays a very good foundation and relevant, uh, I, I, I don't, maybe introduction to what God really has put on my heart for this morning. And, and the thing about it, man, I, I am beside myself sometimes that God would even put anything on my heart at all. I, I don't know if you're like that at all. If you think about God for a minute, all right, God is not uh, a, a Magic Johnson, right? He's not somebody that you can that you can understand and touch and see and look all around and study. And I just picked a name out of the wind, you know? I mean, I could have picked any name. God has no, God has no creator. That makes me dizzy. I, I mean, literally, physically makes me dizzy thinking about the grandeur and who God is way more than I am. He's way more than I am. He's, he's so far beyond what I am that he is able to create me. That just blows my mind. And yet the same God who has no beginning, no creator, no origination point, no abode, nothing can contain him. What on earth is he? He's my father. The same God that I cannot get one basic understanding of in my own opinion i can't i can't grasp him at all and yet and yet he's my savior you know what i'm saying he's, he's so big and yet to to relate to me he makes himself so small and that blows my mind man it blows my mind. It prompts me to a position of rightful worship where I say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And in other words, I say, my kingdom go, my will be second. You know what I'm saying? If I don't know who God is, if I don't get this idea of God. And so I don't know, man, I think I just get things a little bit backwards and I get a little bit bored with God. And that has nothing to do with God. That has everything to do with my remedial understanding. And yet God speaks. And yet God gives more grace, and yet God gives more mercy. Even in those times of fog in your walk, God still gives more grace, does he not? That he just shows up, man. And he just reminds you that he's here. He reminds you that he still desires to talk with you. He reminds you, even, even if you're you know, far from him or feel far from him this morning, that he, his desire is to be near to you, and yet he has no bound. Doesn't that blow your mind? My mind is blown. My mind's blown by what he's given me, given us this church for this year, and we'll get into that. But Acts chapter 7, we are interacting with a gentleman named Stephen. Do you remember Stephen? Do you remember there was an argument between the Jews and the Hellenists? And the Hellenists are Jews, but they were Grecian Jews. They were Jews that had adopted the Grecian culture. And, and their argument was in the early church that their widows were being shorted at the daily distribution, right? The church supports widows. The church supports orphans and the fatherless, right? And that, that's about it, by the way. That's about it. If you look through the, all the pages of scripture and what does the church, who does the church provide for financially other than the, you know, the staff or whatever, which by the way is just not the philosophy of this church right now, but it might be later, is the widows and the orphans and the fatherless. Everyone else, man, it, it, you know, we want to serve the spiritual needs. Does that make sense? But the widows early on, there was an issue. And so Peter in his wisdom and the apostles in their early wisdom said, look, we, we need to teach the word of God. We need to make sure the word of God does exactly what Jesus told us to do with it, create disciples, Judea, Samaria to the end of the world. And so they looked and they said, pick among you seven faithful men to serve tables. It's awesome. And then you find this one, Stephen mentioned first and the Bible says that he was full. Remember how we talked about that? Full of the Holy Spirit full of wisdom, full of favor. He was a man that was full. And, and Stephen, very, very cool. Stephen, a Greek name, very wise, put a Greek over the, the Grecian issue. Very, very wise. I love it. Maybe he was a Greek, maybe he wasn't. But his, I mean, you never hear about Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hezekiah, and Stephen. <laughs> no, it's a Greek name. Stephen, his, his actual full name is Stephen Asimakopoulos, Demetrios Papadopoulos Corneotis. That's his full name, full name. He's a Greek. And they put him over the daily distribution, man, a very, very wise. And yet this Stephen 
was faithful in the little things. He was faithful to just serve tables, man. And what happens is God starts to use him. The Bible says earlier in Acts chapter 6 that mighty wonders, signs and wonders start coming through this man. It's amazing. It's so cool. God will so bless you if you do what he's called you to do. If you just do the small things, the devil's not in the details, Yahweh's in the details. I've said that for years. Jesus is in the details. That if we care about the small things, God says, okay, I can trust you with the little, now I'll give you the lot, right? Now I'll give you the more. And so Stephen, he starts to be a great witness in the early church. And what happens now, because now the gospel's kind of confined to Israel, confined to Jerusalem, it's kind of blowing up, but God starts to use things like Stephen to move the gospel outside, to get to Samaria and all of the world. And so Stephen gets into some trouble. He gets into some trouble because the elders of Israel that think they know everything, right? They come against Stephen and they cannot, they, the Bible says that Stephen just, he just threw down, man. They could not stand against him in terms of his wisdom. And so he's accused of some things, but look at Acts chapter seven, because now they want to take him out. They have got, they've, they raised up false witnesses against him, just like they did against Jesus. Acts chapter 7, verse 1, in our verse-by-verse -verse study, I'm excited, says, Then the high priest said, Are these things so? What things? What things? Now, it's all in chapter 6, but this is what Stephen was accused of. And you've got to remember that the apostles, the early church, Jesus of Nazareth was a man that lived a regular life for 29 years, 11 months, and however many days, I'm not sure. At the age of 30, he starts a public ministry where he starts to teach things like, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the, are the meek. Uh, he starts to teach things like, um, like, give to Caesar what is Caesar, but give to God what is God's. And he starts to say things like, I am the one sent to deliver the people, to deliver the people of God. He starts to say things like that. And so people start to get intrigued with him. And as they're intrigued with him and crowds start to gain around him, he starts to do things like feeding thousands of people at one time with just a handful of food. He starts to do things where people that are dead, dead for days, get out of the grave and walk. And so people, you got to understand when Jesus came on the scene, the whole world in terms of Israel, Jerusalem changed. And then the same man, three years later, they put on a, a Roman cross, Pontius Pilate, not even consenting to it, saying, I find, no, I find nothing wrong with this man at all. And yet they put him onto a cross wrongfully. And as he's on the cross, he speaks to the father. And he says, it's over. To tell us I, it's finished. The, the separation between God and man is finished because of me, not because of anyone else. And the veil in the temple is torn from top to bottom. The whole city knows about this. This is the Holy of Holies. They, it, it, the, everybody knows that this happened at the precise time that Jesus died on the cross. And then three days later, as he said he was going to, as he said he was going to, he got out of death by himself. And so everything has changed. Everything should be changed for us because of this truth. And you say, well, that was so long ago. I've never seen that on Fox News or CNN. Well, come on, man. We got, the, think about this. One man, and here we are 2,000 years later, and, and we're still talking about him. Not only that, we're still forming our lives around this one man. Just, just hold, that, hold that thought by itself. That alone should make us, cause us, create in us an intrigue that something is different about this man. Here we are thousands of years later. And, and we're in a, you're in a church on a Sunday morning on the weekend, finally Friday. You know what I'm saying? You're on a, you, you got up this morning, came to first service, y'all, mm -hmm, you know? Because of this man. And you say, well, I don't believe because I didn't see it on Fox News. Come on, man. I love that. It, it, it was in the Santa Claus. I'm, I miss Christmas already. Do you? That movie, The Santa's, no, I don't. <laughs> You're a mean one. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I love that because at one point in the movie, the guy goes, well, Santa's not real. And the kid goes, is a million dollars real? He goes, yeah. Well, have you ever seen it? No. I love that. It means seeing is believing. Seeing is believing. Man, that's kid stuff. Man, Jesus said, blessed are they that believe and that have not seen. To, 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 read, the, to read the environment. To, to listen to the, what's gone on on this earth in the last 2,000 years, Jerusalem, Israel, the Jew becoming a nation again. All of these things bear witness of something very different. And Stephen was an example of somebody who was filled with this man, filled with the very spirit of God. He was a man that was filled. And yet he was accused. 
he was accused of speaking blasphemous words against Moses. This is all back in, in, uh, in, in chapter 6, verse 11. They accused Stephen of speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God. In verse 13, they accused him of speaking blasphemous words against the temple and against the law. Okay, and that's a big deal for them. And finally, in verse 14, they accused him. The high priest says, are these things so? They accused him of saying Jesus was going to destroy the temple and change the customs given by Moses. Okay, that's a twisting of what Jesus said. You know that, right? Because Jesus did say, destroy this temple and I'll build it back up in three days. But he was not talking about the temple in Jerusalem. Just like today, there are many talking heads out there that twist the word of God to get across there some sort of agenda. Let that not be said about us, okay? Let's just take the word for what the word says, man. Jesus said to the one church in uh, Church of Philadelphia, you have not denied my name, you have held to my word. And we should hold to his word as well because they twist it, man. And they got Jesus all wrong because they heard what they wanted to hear. Basically, Stephen is accused of words. Do you see this? He's accused of words. You ever heard this? Sticks and stones may break my bones. Ever heard that? Like, no, we've never heard it that awesomely. <laughs> Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. What a daggone lie that is, isn't it? Your words are powerful, aren't they? Your words are super powerful, either, either, either for good in your life that you tell your wife you love her, you tell your husband you love her, you tell your, your, your boss you're thankful to be at work, you're like, I hate work. Yeah, well, yeah I know, that's a problem. <laughs> you, you know, you're thankful. You know, your words mean so much. Somebody serves you and you say thank you. You say appreciate that, man. Your words mean so much and words are so powerful. Pierre Duplessis, and I have no idea who that is, but that's a cool name right there, Pierre Duplessis. You know, that's cool. He said this, words create worlds. I think that's right. And Stephen, the words that he said have ignited in them a world of hurt. It's the truth. Someone once said this, be sure to taste your words before you spit them out. Isn't that amazing? I like, I, I like that one personally. What you say, ultra powerful, and yet we write cute little nursery rhymes to lie to our kids. <laughs> what you say is ultra powerful. Words are all that Stephen is accused of, but these words are major. Blasphemy against God, blasphemy against Moses, against the law, against the temple. All, these are all things that they would stone him for, by the way. These are all things that could condemn a man uh, to death. And so what he does, what we're going to see now, is Stephen goes into the longest sermon in the Bible. <laughs> That's debatable because you could say, well, Psalms is a sermon. Okay, professor. Okay. This is the longest from, from the beginning to the end, the longest sermon we have. Now, we're going to move very quickly through it. And some would say that he's trying to show his intellectual prowess, but that's not what he's doing. He's actually answering them, are these things so? The high priest has asked. He's answering them strategically because you're going to see an undercurrent, an, a theme, an underline through everything that he says. He's answering them evangelically because he's trying to reach them for the truth and he's answering them prophetically because some things that he says are even prophetic still today they have not come to pass it's very cool so verse 2 says this and he said this is Stephen brethren and fathers I like that it's it's respectful first of all very respectful brethren and fathers listen the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, which to me sounds like something you spread on bread. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Yo, man, pass that Mesopotamia. Sorry. It's like potatoes in a mess. I don't know. Whatever, Jared. Okay, before Mesopotamia, Abraham, he appeared to Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran and said to him, God speaking to Abraham. Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. Now already, you might be hearing a theme of Jesus. Already. Because Jesus as well stepped out of his dwelling stepped out of heaven, God himself, and came to earth to fulfill for man what man could not fulfill for himself. And yet when he came, he did not come in the chariots of heaven. He came and had nothing. He was a baby. In fact, Jesus never owned anything in his life, according to the scriptures, except for three days he owned a grave. Exactly Abraham, same thing. Abraham never actually got an inheritance in the promised land, but he did buy 
the burial place that he buried his wife in, which they buried him in. Isn't it interesting? So there's already this, for you and I, maybe not for them, maybe not for them, but for you and I, there's already this under, undercurrent of, of the Messiah of Jesus Christ. And so it says here, and God gave him no inheritance in it, verse 5 of chapter 7, not even enough to set his foot on, but even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. Jesus had no children, no children, but he has many descendants. Verse six, but God spoke in this way that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they should bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, said God. And after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob and Jacob begot the 12 patriarchs. One thing, one thing to understand as we continue in this sermon given by Stephen is that the Jews not only lived in the present, but they very much lived in the past. They very much lived in the, their heritage, their past, even to today, is, is super important to them. They lived basically in the past, kind of like Uncle Rico. <laughs> Y'all want to see my video? <laughs> if you've never seen Napoleon Dynamite, you're blank staring, and that's okay. Moving on. <sighs> Bet I can throw a football over the mountains. Okay, their history, their history, extremely important to them. They have great respect for the dead, great respect for the dead, almost more respect for the dead than they do for the living. And so Stephen, as he goes through, kind of starts this detailed sermon, it probably would be welcomed by them. They're like, okay, he's going to go through our, our foundations and our history. He's going to set himself straight. One thing he is accused of is blasphemy against the temple. Remember that? He's accused of blasphemy against the temple. But check this out, talking about strategically answering the Pharisees, the high priests, the Sadducees, the elders, he's setting them up a little bit. Maybe he's trying to reach and reason with them. He says, the God of glory appeared to Abraham when he was where? Mesopotamia. And even when he came into where they were presently, the promised land, where they are presently, God spoke to him. But notice, no temple. Isn't that strategic? Isn't that interesting? He's not trying to demolish their foundations. That's what he's accused of. You're going to take down what we, what we all stand for. You're going to change the customs of Moses. He's not trying to do that. That accusation is false. He's trying to establish their foundations and open their eyes, which God is trying to do to us as well. To open their eyes to the fact that through Jesus, the foundations are fulfilled. The foundations are fulfilled and it's time to move on. What do you do with a foundation? What do you do with a foundation? You build on it. Absolutely. You build on it. And so he's not trying to demolish the foundation. He's trying to show them it is time to build. Look what he goes into next in verse 9. And the patriarchs. So he's called them fathers. He's called them brethren. He's, he, and now he's, now he's going to mention patriarchs, which are like the fathers, right? The lead fathers or whatever. And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles. Is this, see, for you and I, this is Jesus. That Jesus himself was sold into Egypt. He was sold into the world to be the ransom for our sins. Do you see that? It, it's, it, there's such a message for us in the modern church that probably wasn't for them, but there is still stuff for them as well. It says, but God was with him and deliver, delivered him out of all of his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now, a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time, and the second time, Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. Now, in the midst of the history lesson, J Jesus is being portrayed very clearly to us and to them he's drawing a very clear line because they know what's happened with jesus as well everybody knows the whole world knows in in terms of this ancient world everybody knows about what's happened to jesus with abraham he was told to leave his own country and to go where god was sending him and when he got there he had nothing and we've already covered this not enough to set his foot on and abraham was to check this out bring forth a people he was to bring forth a people that would be freed from bondage 
serving God and even looking different than the world. That's typified for us in the mentioning of circumcision. Looking different than the world. Now he moves on to Joseph. Very interesting. Joseph was rejected by the patriarchs. Just like Jesus was rejected by those Stephen is even talking to. But notice this, notice this. They recognize him the second time. They will recognize him the second time. This is much more prophetic for them than anything because we know that Jesus right now in total is is rejected by the Jews. He was rejected by the Jews at his first coming, but the Bible testifies that he will be accepted as their Messiah at his second coming, just like Joseph. Notice there was famine, the father's finding no sustenance. And so Joseph arrives on the scene, but they don't recognize him. This is what Judaism had turned into. This is what, Israel, this is what Jerusalem had turned into. They didn't even have the, the, capital, the right to capital punishment. Did you know that? Which was a prophecy that when the scepter was removed from Israel, Jerusalem, the Jew, the Messiah would come. And that scepter was the right to govern themselves. And they didn't have that. The whole nation had become a famine. Everything about worshiping of God had become a famine. And yet Jesus came to deliver them and they rejected him just like Joseph. You see, Stephen is not trying to do away with their foundations. Their foundations are good. He's not trying to do away with them. Jesus and the apostles, the disciples, the church was never meant to crack up the foundations of Judaism. You understand? It was always meant to build on the foundation that God had laid. This is why the Old Testament can't even be understood without the New Testament in its totality. Do you know that? The key, you guys have like uh, email accounts or stuff, or you got like little phones with passcodes on it. The passcode to the Old Testament is the New Testament. I want you to know that. To get into the full OS of what God was doing in those days, even in the early days of creation, resides in the person of Jesus Christ and the writings of the New Testament. He is trying, Stephen is trying to deliver the message that the era of foundation is past. The era of foundation is past. Jesus has come. Verse 14. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him. 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt. This is interesting. 75 people went down to Egypt. And guess what happened there? Without a temple, without the high priest, without Judaism, what happened to them? They exploded in numbers. They flourished in Egypt. Remember that? Millions of people came out with Moses into the promised land. And so there's a message from Stephen here. There's a message to them even from Stephen in this. And it says, if I can find my place again. So Jacob, verse 15, chapter 7, went down to Egypt and he died. He and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. And so there it is. The only only real piece of property that Abraham ever owned was his grave. Isn't that cool? Same thing with Jesus. But Jesus broke through. I'll dig that. But when the time, amen. I was wondering when I was going to get a Trafon response this morning. I'm like, ain't there any any good points yet? But when the time of the promise, y'all, it was funny. We listened to the radio going home last week, 2.30, we're on the radio, 89.7 Grace FM. And I'm I'm preaching about, I don't know if that was Revelation or what is on the radio right now. But all you heard, there was a good point and you would hear in the background, get some of that. (laughs) That's right. It was definitely Trafon. (sighs) But when the time of the... That means millions of people know how old you are, Chen. That's, that's what it means. Okay. But when the time of the promise, verse 17 of Acts chapter 7. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dwelt treacherous, dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. And you might remember what happened. The Pharaoh that arose after the Pharaoh that knew Joseph said the Egypt, the... The Jews are getting too numerous. They're, they're, more, they're more numerous than the Egyptians. They're going to overtake us just by numbers. Kill the firstborn. That's when Moses was born. Now remember the same edict was given at the time of Jesus' birth, right? Where Herod said, who is this king? Remember that? Kill them all. Kill them all. And yet Jesus, they hid him and he fled. And says, this man, we're at, okay. Verse 20, at this time Moses was born. And why, you know, why am I drawing a comparison between Moses and Jesus? Because Moses gave a prophecy that God would raise up a prophet like him. 
that Moses was in some way a type of Jesus. You got to understand that. Joshua was in some way a type of Jesus. Joseph in some way was a type of Jesus, a portrait and a picture of Jesus to come. And that is why Jesus and the New Testament are the password to the Old Testament. Because all of these are pictures of what was to come. So Moses... At this time, Moses was born, verse 20, and was well-pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them. He supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand. You see, Moses felt a call. He was like, I'm a, I'm a Jew, and yet I am, I am in Pharaoh's household. I have all the wisdom of Egypt. I have the best schooling. I have the riches of Egypt, and yet my people are oppressed. And so Moses felt called to release his people. Now that was his first coming. What, what's interesting is that Moses has three periods of life. One period is the period where he was in Egypt. The second period was his period when he was out of Egypt. The Bible would say wilderness or not there. And then he comes back and takes them home, takes them to the very edge of the promised land. It's very interesting, very good parallel. Not time, we don't have time to develop it today, but there's great parallel there, but there's more to come on that. So it says here, for he supposed in verse 25 that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. They did not understand. Another, this is big. Another character, Moses, another character. We've had Joseph, we've had Abraham. Another character, Moses, same message. Moses was sent by God to deliver his people. Same message, sent by God to deliver his people. But when he first came, he was rejected by them. It wasn't until Moses came back, which we'll get to in a minute, that they accepted him. It's it's an accusatory in a way, what Stephen says to them. Very interesting. They did not consider, they did not understand, he says. It's accusatory towards them. To not, to, when he says to not understand, you got to understand this because this is for you too. It's for me too. This word understand means they did not consider the evidence with wisdom. They did not consider the evidence with wisdom. That's what it means there, that word understand. To consider, to behold, to examine and yet not to have wisdom about it, you don't understand it. That's the truth of it all. To to have understanding is to not just hear about Jesus, the gospel, what's happened to you, but it's to go out into the world and respond to it. That's to understand it. If you come to church, and and man, I tell you what, I'm glad you're here, but if you're here and then you go back out into your life and you are totally different, and you, you, you know, in the way that you live, are rejecting the power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus in your life, then I want to tell you, you haven't rejected Jesus, you don't understand and it's God that grants understanding and that understanding comes through faith and humility submission and subjection to God gives you brings that invites that God pours out understanding you just don't understand you know people get all upset I get I I see people so angry especially on social media going back and forth with people that reject Jesus and they get so angry how dare you this how dare you that they just don't understand unarm your love man They just don't understand. You know what I'm saying? My kid Lincoln, eight years old, doesn't understand Jack. You know what I'm saying? He understands cheese girls. That's it. He doesn't even say grilled cheese. It's like, what do you want to eat? Cheese girls. What does that mean? Grilled cheese. That's about all he understands. Everything else, I don't sit him down and get angry with him because he can't balance a checkbook. You know what I'm saying? If y'all even have checkbooks anymore, you whip out a checkbook in front of me at the grocery store, believe me, I'm groaning in the spirit. You know? (laughs) But he just doesn't understand. To consider and examine something and not have wisdom about it is to not understand. This might have been a very clear jab at them. Look at the next verse, verse 26. And the next day he appeared to two of them. And so if somebody doesn't understand, what do you do? Reject them and get angry. No, you pray to God that he would give you words for them. Do you understand? You, you soften your heart towards them. You don't get all angry towards them. You don't reject them. We, we receive someone who doesn't have an understanding of the gospel because that's an opportunity for us to say, God, speak through me. I need new words. Mine aren't working. You know what I'm saying? 
And so, man, if the, even this morning, you know, you, you might be why, you know, my sister who I just spent the holidays with, my mom, my dad, my brother, my cousin's uncle, whatever. They don't, they, they, you know, I can't talk to them because they don't receive Jesus. Are you serious? You need to pray for better words. Not better words, different words. Personal words, relational words. Because they just don't understand. You look at it like that, it'll soften your heart. I, I, I'm telling you, it softens mine. And that's tough to do. And verse 26, and the next day, sometimes, sometimes it's tough. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them saying, this is Moses. Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Same thing they said to Jesus. Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian where he had two sons. Check this out. When, when Moses went to Midian, he had two sons. Therefore, what did he go to do? Find a bride. Very interesting. He went to find a bride. And Jesus now was in the world, rejected by the world, ascended to the Father. And now by the Holy Spirit, he's collecting unto himself a bride for the marriage supper of the Lamb. That final day when the new Jerusalem comes out, man, when Jesus creates and delivers the new Jerusalem, new heaven and new earth, and we as his bride and new Jerusalem as his bride dwell there forever with him. It's exactly what he's doing now. And when 40 years, verse 30, and when 40 years had passed, an angel, and 40 is a number of completion. It's one of the numbers of completions of the Bible. It's, a, it's like an era, an age. When 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, take your sandals off your feet. That word for sandals in the Greek is Nikes. I'm sorry. Take your... I'm wearing Solomon's today. How, oh, man, anyway. Okay, how, that's interesting. Solomon's going to come up in our study. Okay, uh, he goes, Take the sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Gasp! You see, he's reciting their own history back to them, but you remember they're accusing him of speaking against the temple. And Stephen reminds them boldly that God spoke to Abraham. It was even called holy ground, and there was no temple. Do you see it? Very interesting. Verse 34 God says, and let this encourage you and comfort you today, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and I have come down to deliver them. And now I will send you to Egypt. I have seen, I have heard, I have come down. Now it's interesting. We call upon God for help all the time. God help me in my trouble. God help me in my oppression. But the thing is, he says, I have heard their groaning. This word for groaning is only used twice in the entire Bible. It's not complaining. Because when we are complaining, that's pride. God, give me something for me. I need this for me. That's a complaint. Do you understand? That's a complaint. And God, man, I tell you what, the Bible says that he resists the proud. I'm not sure that he, re, he, he can respond to complaining because that leaves you in a state of complaining. Do you understand? It's like rewarding your kids for doing dumb things. God's a good father. We're not going to do that. He's not going to do that either. This word for groaning is the same when it was written in Romans when Paul said that even when you don't know what to say to God, the spirit groans within you. That's the word. And so it's not a complaining about your mama, your daddy, your husband, your sister, your brother. Your... It's not a complaining. It's a groaning because you're taking it in righteousness. You're groaning in front of the Lord. That's when God hears. God comes down to help and deliver. Isn't that cool? And then it says, and now verse 35, this Moses whom they rejected saying who made you a ruler and a judge is the one God sent to be ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. This is huge, these things that he's saying. For any of these elders truly seeking God, they would somehow be softening because Stephen points out here that the people rejected Moses. And, and Moses was their God-appointed leader, which means Stephen, by calling him a God-appointed leader, has not rejected Moses, okay? Because he's accused of rejecting Moses. He's accused of blaspheming against Moses, but he just, he is reinforcing, no, Moses was a God-appointed leader, but he points out the elders of Israel rejected Moses. And he's already pointed out that the patriarchs of Israel rejected Joseph, who was another God-appointed leader. You see his cases building. Do you see it? His case is building. I love it. He is using the foundation to build his case, not tearing it down like he's accused of. Verse 37. 
This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. This is he who is in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel, and your Bible might say church. It's interesting. This is he who was in the church in the wilderness. I like that. That's kind of, I feel like that's kind of what I am anyway. Whatever. With the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, that's the law, the Ten Commandments, whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Remember, Moses was so long up on that mountain with God that they thought there something had happened to him. And so they turned to Aaron and they said, make us gods to worship. That's what he's talking about. Verse 41. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. This is what Judaism had become. Verse 42. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Rimphan, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. And so here it is. He's starting to now address the whole temple thing. Watch this. However, verse 48, as you all know, as you patriarchs all have read in the prophets, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. This is your own... This is your own books, your own scrolls, your own prophets. As the prophet has said, verse 49, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? God is not confined to a temple. God is greater than that. God is not confined. God is boundless and endless and eternal. And yet we have confined him. You have confined him to a temple. It's very clear. Remember, he's saying when our fathers, remember when our fathers carried the tabernacle, they carried God's house. Remember that. You think we can carry God's house? God is not in a tabernacle. God is with us. That's the message he's delivering. And just as Joseph was rejected by his brothers, Moses was rejected by his brothers, the law was rejected by the people and transgressed, even now the works of the law, he's telling them very clearly, are being exalted higher than the person of God. Scripture confirms. And now we're going to transition. Watch this. Scripture confirms confirms the foundations have been laid and it is time to recognize the scriptures fulfilled and he's saying to them don't miss it again you know god says that to me all the time you ever god ever teach you a lesson that you know he's tried to teach you a thousand times don't miss it again i love this message thorough complete clear it's even convicting that the foundation has been laid the foundation is strong it's good but it's complete now it's time to recognize what god wants to do right now which is perfect for us perfectly where we are as a church and I love how relevant and perfect in terms of timing this scripture set is because I believe that God is saying the same thing to us this year in the new year in 2018. The foundation is laid. It is strong. It is good. But it is complete. And I have fought this. I want you to know. I have fought this personally for the last couple of weeks ever since God started to lay it on my heart. And, and I've shared it with, I've shared, I've shared this with maybe one or two people, and yet God has confirmed it through several others, and even confirmed it in a dream, because you know I'm a dreamer of dreams. You know that, right? It's crazy. I, I am definitely a dreamer of dreams. In 2016, God gave us, this church, a message of rest. Do you remember? We were crazy busy, and we still are. And as we were crazy busy... We began to, I began to see stress, not even upon just myself, but upon the people, not even just the leaders, but many of you who serve here, I began to see stress. And I sought the Lord over it. And the Lord says, all that you're doing is good, but I want you to rest in me. That doesn't mean stop doing things. You know that, right? 
Resting in the Lord doesn't mean stop doing things. Resting in the Lord meant do all that you're doing, but rest in my strength, rest in my righteousness, rest in my willful results. And from that, in this church, and this is family time for the next about 10 minutes, just so y'all know. From that, which means everybody is welcome and everybody's family, I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying Acts chapter 50, Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, verse 50, we're, we're kind of done with that, that laid a foundation. I want to share with you what God has put on my heart for this church this year. And so this is very, very, very important to me. I'm, I'm jittery inside, very, very important. Resting from that came a culture in this church, which you probably feel and experience very well, of grace and safety. And that no matter who is serving or leading, no matter how they are leading in terms of your style, or what the ministry even is, our strategy and culture has become, we are not afraid to fail. That has, been, that has become our culture, which was not there before God gave us the command to rest in him. That even if we don't get the results we want, we're not afraid to go all in for God. Does that make sense? And that culture is now in this church. We're not afraid to make mistakes. We will make mistakes. And if you're here today, and if I say something you don't agree with, and that's it, and you're not coming back, that's not the culture of this church. I'm going to say things that definitely challenge you. And, and, and sometimes maybe will even offend you. Sometimes. Mostly every study. <laughs> But you know what? We're okay. Even if, I, even if I say something stupid, now not something, you know, completely doctrinally off, we've got to deal with that. But if I say something dumb like Uncle Rico, you know, goodness gracious, I've had people leave this church over me mentioning Rudolph from the pulpit. True story. I'm like, go on then. Rudolph? Shoot. We are not afraid to make mistakes. And we are not afraid to fail. We are to love God and love this church. And in that, we will be imperfect. But we will rest in God's perfection. Because in our weakness, he is made strong. That's what he gave us in 2016. Then last year, God called us to refresh. Remember that? It's only been a couple days. <laughs> After a period of resting, it's only natural that a body would be refreshed. And so we challenged ourselves to make God's calling sure in our lives and in our ministries in this church. If it's not fresh, if it's not filled with joy, if it's not blessing God and blessing the people, if it's not blessing us, if it's not filling us, then remember this, I've said it at least 20 times this year, take a big step back. Remember that? It's, it's another building upon the culture of safety and a culture of saying, I think God has moved on and therefore I'm gonna move on too. It's okay. This year, I have fought this for weeks, man because I don't have the faith for it. God has, and then he gave me a better understanding, by the way. God has given the call on me and on this church to build and to grow. To build and to grow. Now that does not necessarily mean physically. It doesn't necessarily mean physically to build or to grow. Although it could, I'm not saying it doesn't, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we are going to grow in numbers or build a building this year. We ain't got the money for that anyway. No, it's not even close, man. We need a million bucks. But we got maybe a tenth of that to invest. There's no way. We don't have the money to build. That's not, I, I, that's not exactly what God is saying. And so when God gave that to me, I got really scared and said, I'm not telling the people that. That's, that's, laying, that's laying something out there that I know that I can't do. And then God showed me something. He showed me that to build and to grow, however, when I'm thinking it's to go from this to this, that's what I thought. That's what, you see what I'm saying? I thought it meant get bigger. Make the, make the canister bigger. But God shows me it's not so much inside. It's not so much I want to grow. I want, I want what's inside to grow. I want to grow and to build. I want to get, look at this, look at this. If I just fill both of these up, which one's more full? Which one's, exactly. And then God corrected my understanding in this. That God's not saying, I want you to build and grow a mega church. Where I was like, I'm not doing that anyway. I don't want to, you know, and God's like, hold on, slow down. Calm down. I want you to grow and to build. I want you to grow and to build, Matt. I want you to be filled. And that's an individual call for this church. We've rested. We've been refreshed. What I believe he means is the foundation is here. It's here. The foundation is good. It is strong. A strong ministry, a strong ministry team, a strong flock, a strong call, a strong presence, a strong purpose. And we, you and I together, are resolute in that we are led, governed, and in total submission dependence on fellowship 
to Jesus Christ alone. That's a strong foundation. He's the head. No other foundation can be laid that will hold. You know that, right? But the foundation here at C4 has been poured. It has been resolved. It has settled. What do you do on a foundation? You build. 1 Corinthians 3 10 through 15 says, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one, each one of you should build with care for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that's already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what he has been built survives, the builder receives a reward. If it's burned, the builder will suffer loss, but will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. The foundation is here. The foundation is good. And now God is calling me, calling you, calling us, calling this church this year to build and to grow. And we all, man, I tell you what, if you're not already a little bit uncomfortable with this, then you're probably not receiving this call. Receive this call that God is calling you to build out and to grow this year. We have a role in this for me. And I've already shared this with you guys. Maybe it was Wednesday. For me right now, for this season, it's to disarm my love. Disarm it. Remember, was that last Wednesday or something? Was it Wednesday? Okay, so not all of you know about that. God has called me to have unarmed love because I have armed, my love is armed and that I have conditions that I place on people. And God has said, that's not like me. What what, What is something about you that's not like God? That's what he wants you to address. And, and for me, as, although I love, man, I love to love and I love people, I realize my love has conditions. And God said, that's not like mine. He wants my heart more like his, disarmed and gift love. And I'm after that. Doesn't mean I gotta have a bigger church. You know what I'm saying? Doesn't mean we gotta be a bigger flock. God confirmed this to me in a dream and I wanna share this, to you and then we're, share this with you and then we're done. I shared the dream with some folks before God had even given me the full meaning. But during prayer on Wednesday night, just this week, God showed me what it means. I dreamt that we were here. We were in this church. Only it wasn't this church. I dream about this church all the time, but it's never this room. It's always some big grand, it's always some big grand room. It's always something different, but it's C4. There were balconies. There was all kinds of stuff. And Matt Wallenberg was finishing up this worship set and people were still coming in. You know who you, you, know who you are. Okay. I was scrambling, and I remember this man, it's, it's so, so vivid, I was scrambling in the back room, trying to find anything that people could sit on. I was bringing out tables, because there were people in the, in the aisleways, there was nowhere to sit, it was so full. And then the worship set finished, and everyone got up and began to leave. They were all lined up, walking out of the back of the sanctuary. And I stopped one lady who she was so sweet. Her face was so sweet. She had warmness in her face. And I asked her, which I truly believe is the spirit of this church. And I asked her, where's everyone going? I'm about to preach. (laughs) I got a good one today, you know. Where's everyone going? And this is what she said. We're all going to the overflow room because it's getting too cold in here. And so I went to the overflow. We had an overflow room. Right now it's like the fellowship room or outside and everyone was filing into the overflow room and i said to myself well i better preach in here because nobody's in the sanctuary and then i woke up and that was it i shared that dream with matt wallenberg and the worship team on wednesday night if you were in there with me you know that i stopped prayer were you in there ben rachel were you in there i stopped prayer right i stopped prayer because god slapped me with the understanding stick does he ever do that with you it's like a two by eight you know boom I stopped prayer and I said, I got it. Because I had already shared the dream. And I said, but I got it now. We are to build, we are to grow individually. And that means as a church, as an individual, me, you, we are each of us to go to the overflow. Because it's getting too cold in our walks. God wants to move us. See what I'm saying? Full, doesn't matter how big we are. Look at this. Just keep pouring in the word of God. Look at that. Just let God work. That's where God wants this church. I truly believe that. That we are to be a church among churches. Not just some community of people that get together and love the Lord. God wants to do a new thing here, man. And we are to go to the overflow. Joel 2, 21 through 24 says, Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice. For the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field. For the open pastures, that's us, we're the beasts of the field. For the open pastures are springing up and 
and the tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the wine yield their strength. Ben and Rachel, you guys got to come up because we're done. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully. Has he not done that in this church? He has given the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain. In the first month, the threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. I love it. I'm so inspired because I didn't even have a full, I, I, I might still not have a full revelation of what God meant by showing me we are to move to the overflow. That the sanctuary is beautiful. We have built a beautiful sanctuary on the foundation of God here. But God wants us to move, each one of us, to the overflow. Where it's much warmer. Where he can work much more in our lives. And for me, right now, that's unarmed love. But it's going to be different. It's, God's going to keep, he's going to peel out more for me. It's time to build. We are to go to the uncomfortable. If you are not uncomfortable in your walk, man, get there. What is God, how is God like that you're not like? Address it. God has given you the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't be okay with this nominal Christianity. Go to the uncomfortable for the Lord. All you his saints, love with unarmed love. Go to the overflow because it's time again to let God refresh. It's time again to let God bring rest. It's time again for God to move us forward into what he's called us to do in our personal relationships with him, in this church, in your heart, in your lives, in this community, in this world, overflow. We are no longer, I will no longer be comfortable with just being filled. I don't want that. God has done too much for me. God showed me this and it's dumb and I like to end on this. God has told me that in this church we are not to just create converts. We are not just to create disciples. We are not just to create ministries. We are to create Fruit Loops. Fruit Loops, man. Loops of fruit. Loops of fruit in our own lives unto God. Holy Spirit working in us in this post-foundation season of this church. Post-foundation season of my walk. Your walk the story of this church and God's eternal plan. The foundation is good and it will hold. The foundation will hold. Jesus, Him crucified and Him resurrected. That's our foundation. It will hold. It's held for 2,000 years. It'll hold. The work of God here at C4 is good. It's firm. But it's a new year. And it's a new call. And together with God leading and guiding us, we will build, we will grow. And I'm looking for the overflow this year. That's what I'm looking for. Because God, you're good. And God, you're worthy to be praised. And God, you're worthy to even respond to when I can't understand or have the faith. Because I can't build anything, man. I can't cause anything to grow. And so I'm frightened, Father. But you said that fear not, I'm with you, man. I'm not giving you that spirit. I'm going to give you a spirit of love and power and a sound mind. Step forward in faith. So, Father, now I know the way to do that. I know that is, God, to let your spirit reign in me. Let your spirit, God, lead and guide me. It's your will be done. It's not mine. It's your kingdom come, my kingdom go. And so, God, we give you this church this year. I'm so thankful, Lord, for your new and fresh call. I'm so thankful to rest in you again that I don't have to come up with anything, God, that the foundation is good. You're not trying to demolish a foundation. You're building on it, and that foundation, boy, is firm, and I'm so thankful. I'm thankful that we stand upon a rock. So this morning, if you, if you don't stand on the rock, you come to Jesus. We want to start that walk with you this morning. We've got some guys up here that will pray with you. If you'd like to receive Jesus, if you'd like to have understanding, you can come forward. Be forgiven of your sins. We'll be available to after service for a bit. Father, we love you. Jesus, it's in your name. We render this service, our hearts, our church, our lives. You are beautiful